All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jillian LeClaire, your Alumni Engagement Officer here at Florida Tech, and I want to thank you all for joining us for this special Lunch and Learn lecture today. In our continued effort to offer the Florida Tech community with meaningful online programming, I'm so pleased to partner with Florida Tech adjunct instructor Jackie Noto to provide this lecture for you on diversity, inclusion, equity, and allyship. Before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping items for you um, that you've probably heard a million times on every Zoom meeting you've had. Um, please leave your microphone on mute throughout the duration of the lecture to prevent any audio feedback. Um, the lecture will be about 45 minutes with 15 minutes at the end designated for questions and discussion. However, if you have any burning questions that you want to ask throughout the presentation, Jackie um, is open to answering them as she goes. So you just go ahead and type those in the chat box. And and that's it. <laughs> um, we are really excited for some education and respectful conversation today. Um, and again, I'm so grateful for Jackie taking the time to do this presentation for us as she volunteered as a Florida Tech adjunct faculty member. So before we get into Jackie's talk, uh, we have alumni joining us from all over the world today. So I want to ask you to please take a moment to go in the chat box and type in your name, your class year, and your location so we can see where everyone's joining us from. Hi, Ed, Laura, Bob, Dan, the Ontario, uh, Massachusetts, Virginia, Florida, Kentucky, New Hampshire, Huntsville, Colorado, Las Vegas, Indiana, Satellite Beach, Texas, Maryland, Boston, North Carolina. So that's awesome. Aruba. Holland. Oh, yeah, Finn, originally from, <laughs> from Holland. Awesome. I saw a couple people register from like the Middle East and somebody from Iceland. So maybe they haven't joined us yet. But thank you all for joining us from wherever you are and taking the time out of your schedule. Um, so just to introduce our wonderful presenter, Jackie Noto works and studies in the field of behavioral science and focuses on creating positive changes in organizational and clinical settings. She is a board certified behavior analyst who received her dual master of science degree in applied behavior analysis and organizational behavior management from Florida Tech. She is currently working on expanding her research while also continuing her education as a PhD student under Dr. Nick Weatherly and Florida Tech's behavior analysis program. Her research interests primarily lie in safety, culture, leadership, social validity, and improvements in the workplace. And with that, I will turn it over to Jackie. Great, thank you so much, Jillian. Hi everyone, it's so lovely to see you today. I'm so happy to see so many faces. Before I get started, I wanna make sure that you can all hear me okay and you can see the screen that says diversity, inclusion, equity, and allyship. Just some head nods, great. Get a head nod, get a thumbs up, perfect. So as Jillian previously said, my name is Jackie Noto. I have an MS degree and a BCBA. My preferred pronouns are she and her. And if you have any questions that we don't get to during the time of our presentation today, you can obviously feel free to email me those in the future, or if you want to talk about anything else, I'd be more than happy to converse with you. To give you a brief idea of what we're going to be going over today, here are some learning objectives. We are going to work to identify some privileges and biases that one may have. We are going to explain why diversity, inclusion, and equity are important within one's workplace. And then we're going to be differentiating between access, diversity, inclusion, equity, and equality. And then lastly, we're going to generate a list of actionable behaviors that can help in promoting allyship for you in your own life, whether that be in your personal life or in your workplace. As a friendly reminder, uh, today, the whole point of today's presentation is not to teach you everything that you're supposed to know. This is only an hour long. I could never teach you everything you need to know in an hour, and I don't know everything you need to know. My role as an educator today is not to provide you with all of the answers, but we kind of just want to introduce some tools, some research to help in deconstructing the world that you currently live in from a more inclusive framework. As I said, this isn't going to answer every question and it's not going to come close to everything you need to learn. This is going to be a lifelong process for you and hopefully today is just going to 
give you some places to begin your own research and begin your own self-reflection. I see a lot of the people in this group are white presenting or white passing, which is amazing. I'm so glad to see so many of you joining the conversation today. And that's just a little quote that I thought I should include today that we as dominant group members must work to overcome our unearned privilege bestowed upon us and educate ourselves. Ignorance is no shield, especially when so many people have courageously chosen to write about their experience. So there's so much that's been taking place and we need to be taking the time and effort to educate ourselves. And you being here is an amazing first step. And I wanna thank you for being here. With that said, today, normally with these kinds of talks, I like some Q&A, some feedback, some give back, but as this is on Zoom, it's going to be a little different. So I would like to request that everyone take out a piece of paper or open up a Word doc or compose an email or open up your Google Docs and have some form of writing utensil because I'm going to be asking you to do some self-reflection notes throughout the course of the presentation. These notes, hopefully you will be able to look back on after we're done with today to give you an idea of where to start with your own research, your own reflections, and just a review of our conversation. While you're doing that, I'm going to leave up some vocabulary on the screen and I'm going to give everyone until 1208 to get out a piece of paper. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with any of the vocabulary on the screen, these are some terms that I'm going to be referring to or saying today that I thought you might want to know before we get into it. So I'm just going to give everyone a little bit more time to open up a document or get a piece of paper and a pen. Beautiful, 1208, let's go. So one of the first things I wanna talk about today is WGAD, also known as who gives a darn for all of my adults out there. So some of the reasons why we should be caring about this idea of inclusion, this cultural competency, this diversity, is that it can improve our quality of service regardless of the population that you're working with. The co cultural competency and your cultural knowledge can significantly improve your quality and the effectiveness of any health service delivery to minority populations. And with proper education and training, professionals of any cultural background can develop the necessary skills to treat and interact with consumers who come from outside of their own culture. It's important to remember that we all have different backgrounds, we all have different histories, we all have different experiences. So different things are valuable to us as individuals. In this inclusion, relevant categories can be more than just race and gender, right? This can also include such topics as disability status, sexual orientation, and engaging with clients that have complex learning histories, including those values that they have, is a big part of being culturally competent and being someone who is able to interact with many different populations. So one of the first questions that you might have for today is, great, that was a lot of words. Where do I start? I know it's important. That's why I came to this talk. What's next? So one simple solution I want to offer to you is to go ahead and take Harvard's implicit bias test. Why should we do this? Well, one of the main reasons to do these exams is to gain insight on your own personal attitudes towards diversity related content, both inside and beyond your workplace. This can help in identifying some areas that you might need further training and be able to continue your own development. One of the important things about being anyone, whether it's an instructor, a manager, a supervisor, anyone in a leadership position, is that we it's crucial that we recognize our own backgrounds and then recognize the backgrounds of those that we're working with. And this can help to prevent alienation and create a classroom where all feel comfortable. So I'm not gonna have you all go take an implicit bias test right now because we only have an hour, but I do want you to go ahead and take a minute Open up that piece of paper we previously have, take 30 seconds, write down some privileges you have, and take 30 seconds and write down some biases you have. I'm not going to ask you to share these with everyone, so just be honest with yourself. One of the reasons we do this is it can help to identify areas in which faculty you need to continue training. So feel free to add to this list throughout your presentation, but now I'm going to give you until 12.11 to go ahead, or 12.12 to go ahead and write that down. Thank you. 
Awesome. I'm seeing some of you look up at the screen now, which means we're probably wrapping up our lists, which is great. I'm going to give like 10 more seconds. Beautiful. So one of the main reasons why I had you write down these items is because if you were to go do something like the implicit bias test that Harvard puts on, they have multiple different categories that you can look at that you might not even be knowledgeable that you have different prejudice or bias in that realm. So sometimes just doing those tests and seeing kind of where you lie can give a big idea as to where you might need continual training. Uh, throughout our presentation, we're going to be talking about more stuff. So if you notice another privilege that happens to come up that you have, write it down. You notice another bias that you thought of while I was talking, go ahead and add to that list. We're going to go through multiple different topics today, and I believe in you to do this on your own. So let's go. So in terms of what we're talking about today, one of the main things we're focusing on is access, diversity, inclusion, and equity in the workplace. We often focus on just diversity. If you look at businesses, you look at schools, you look at programs, there's always a oh, diversity initiative, the diversity committee, the diversity council. Diversity is just a step. So in the research that I've read through and evaluated, it kind of seems like the overwhelming majority says that this is sort of a four part process. So the first part is access, then diversity, then inclusion, and hopefully equity. So access, one example of access would be, um, I'm having a house party. An example of diversity is, you're all invited to my house party. Let's say tomorrow around 5 p.m., I'll see you all there. I did it, I invited you, now what? You have the invitation, you're included, is that inclusion? Is that equity? Probably not. So when we talk about diversity versus inclusion, diversity is going to give us the space in the room, but it doesn't leave any room for our thoughts or our way of lives. Inclusion, which is that third part, will change the room. It's going to make sure that we all have a seat and a voice. Once you hear the voice, you need to act to make those changes. And that's inclusion. That's what matters. This is from a talk by Kenyola Matthews that she gave on TED Talk, which is included in my reference list at the end if you wanna go watch it at the end. But essentially, it's bringing up that point that this isn't just about diversity and inclusion, it's about community and belonging. If you are allowing people into the room but not listening to them, that is not inclusion. So I wanna give an example of this. This is my friend Osaibia Bagirin. I asked him if I could use this example in my presentation and he said, absolutely. And he is an individual that I met my freshman year of my undergraduate studies in U University of New England in Maine. And when I met him, he said, hi, my name's O. And I said, O? That's like your whole, your whole name is O? He said, well, no, but like my name's too hard to pronounce. So I just let people call me O. Could you imagine changing your own name to make it easier for the people around you. Like, I'm going to look at some of your names. Could you imagine Cindy? If people were like, oh, Cindy's too hard for me to say, just call me C. You would never, you would never. So even now, Osivier is a intern at a hospital. And in his recent encounters with a student of his that he was teaching, they referred to him as, okay, Otis Spunkemeyer. That is insane to me that we would be so disrespectful of someone's name, which is such a big part of who we are as an individual. So on this note, you know, when you're in your company, when you're in your classroom, when you're in the business, people have names, use their names. Every single person is an individual, learn about them, learn their names. On that note, learn their pronouns, learn their lives. Different people have different backgrounds, different experiences. So it's important to take into account what that individual prefers, and then being respectful enough to do what that individual does prefer. This is an example um, from now it's like seven years ago. And when I brought this up to a side VA and I said, hey, would you mind if I talked about this? He proceeded to tell me that I was the first person who ever insisted on calling him his true name that he preferred to be called. And that from that point on, he had people refer to him as his name. So it's one of those things where it doesn't seem like a huge incident for you in your life as the person who says his name, but for Osivia, this was life changing that I would care enough to learn his name. 
On that note too, we want to be modeling the behaviors that we wish to see. So when we are referring to people, you know, not everyone uses she, her, he, him pronouns. So maybe it's an option to refer to people as, good morning, everyone. Hi, folks. How's everyone doing today? And then even including, you know, having that gender shift in your language can be helpful for if you have uh, any transgender individuals in your community or in your classroom, it's going to be able to normalize the practice of providing your pronouns. So as you can see in my name here at the top, I have she, her after me. That way, if anyone was trans and they perhaps weren't passing for the gender that they identify with, it alleviates that concern. If all people were to put she, her, hers in their email message, it wouldn't it wouldn't pinpoint the individuals that have to do it for themselves. These shifts in language and these cultural norms are invaluable to gender non-conforming people's safety and their sense of belonging. If you constantly feel like you need to separate yourself by doing this one thing, it's not really an inclusive environment for you or for those around you. So next we're going to talk briefly. We talked a little bit about access, a little bit about diversity, a little bit about a conclusion, but now I kind of want to get to the point of equity, which is going to be our main takeaway today and this is going to start at eight. This is Miss like Paloma Medina, and, and she's talking right about okay. diversity, inclusion, equity in the workplace. And one of the main things that she talks about is that shift from diversity to equity. So let's take a moment and listen. Sound on me. Why are we talking about diversity at all? Diversity isn't what our brains need. It's really just a metric to understand if equity is happening. So let me explain. Let's say that at your company, 4% uh, of the employees at your company are people of color, but 30% of the US population is people of color. So this happens again and again, year after year at your company. Sorry. This, that racial diversity number, it's an early indicator that it's likely that there's inequity happening somewhere in your hiring pipeline. But let's say that you change how you hire and you hire a bunch of people of color and you get it to 30% of your employees are people of color. What? We're done, right? Can we celebrate? Can, can we celebrate? I love that you're not being like, yeah, we're done. You know, something's weird here because this new racial diversity number still doesn't paint the full equity picture. It doesn't tell us if those employees are being compensated equitably to their white counterparts, it doesn't tell us about how they're being treated by their white peers in everyday work lives. And yet we're still knowing this, diversity isn't the core need. Equity is the core need. Why do we talk so much more about diversity? I think we talk more about diversity because it's safer. So that's something that I love. I think we've talked more about diversity because it's safer. It's easier for us to say, we're going to form a diversity committee than it is to say that we're going to increase our equitable hiring processes in the next two years. Focusing on, oops, sorry. Focusing on the aspect of equity is different than just allowing the people into the room. It's giving everyone the supports that they need to have equal access. This is equitable treatment. So I wanted to include this little graphic here that I drew up um, and I didn't, I didn't draw it up, let me be completely honest with you, but I did alter it because originally in this third quadrant here, there was a little child who couldn't see over the fence, but I thought, why not include someone in a wheelchair? Another example of a privilege I have, I am able to walk, you know? So having someone in a wheelchair is a different sort of privilege that we might not have previously thought about. So I decided to include it. So the difference between equality and equity, right? Equality is the assumption that everyone benefits from the same support. So you can see box, 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 works for the two able-bodied individuals, doesn't work for the individual who needs to utilize a wheelchair. Whereas equity, individuals are given the supports they needed to access the game. So the man who's tall, he doesn't need the box. The woman who's shorter, she does need the box. And the woman who's in the wheelchair, she needs the ramp. Um, and then the ultimate goal that I aim for as a teacher that I would suggest individuals aim for in any sort of realm that they're in is justice. And this is where that systematic or systemic barrier has been removed and it allows all individuals to access the game 
without accommodations because the source of the inequity was addressed. So in this example, the source of inequity is that fence. We address the source of inequity by making it a chain link fence so everyone can see through it. Then you don't have the issue of who can see over it. And this might seem like something that isn't super prevalent to us as white individuals or white passing individuals, but when you view research of interviews of members of marginalized groups, overall, they are severely underpaid and severely underrepresented. When they're asked how they are feeling about their place of work, they often report that they feel left out of things, that if they could leave right now, they would, and that they find it difficult to work there because of a poor climate. So one of our roles is that we need to ensure that if we are overhearing something like this, we're stopping the discussion, stopping a conversation and identifying a time that something might be said that was insensitive or something might've been said that made someone feel uncomfortable. You don't have to make the individual feel bad about saying it, but calling attention to that comment, explaining why it demotes inclusivity, taking it apart, and then maybe discussing that person's prior experience in their background and what might have instilled that bias and going into something like that. Because one of the important things to keep in mind here is everyone that's in this room pretty much, I assume that you're a leader. I assume you're a leader in your place of work and leaders are not only supposed to talk the talk, but we're supposed to walk the walk. So as leaders, I expect you to be the kind of people that are implementing these sorts of changes and these expectations in your workplace because a big part of being inclusive is the culture in which you work. So you might be saying, okay, well, once again, Jackie, how do I do that? You keep saying a lot of words, that means nothing to me. I need next steps, I need actions, I need directions. Great, so some little tips and tricks I have. One, obtain a social network, diversify that social network, have different individuals from you in that social network. Obtain a mentor, someone that if you're having a difficult conversation, you can go to and ask them about. It could be a mentor, a mentor doesn't necessarily need to be someone who's been in the company longer than you or someone that's older than you. If you wanted a mentor on sorts of topics like diversity and inclusion, perhaps you could ask someone around you who you think would be a beneficial person to provide you with information on that. Um, then we wanna make sure we're maintaining boundaries and limits. As I said on our last slide, if something isn't right, speak up about it. Hatred isn't something that should be tolerated at your place of work. Your opinions are valid and you should feel comfortable at the place that you're working. And on that note, we're practicing self-care too. Last but not least, one of my big tips and tricks that I'm gonna briefly go into here because I think I would be doing a shame to myself if I didn't is using behavior analysis. So behavior analysis is the realm that I am from and I have a degree in, um, but I'm just going to give a little bit of information on how behavior analysis could be beneficial in this. So you might be saying behavior analysis, well, one of the things that we need to be aware of is as other individuals in the realm, we need to be aware of how our responses might shape and define behaviors of others. So there might be uncomfortable situations that you've been in in which you've involuntarily shaped up someone's behavior. And then also, while it's easier to view these behaviors as traits of a specific individual, these behaviors are far more likely to be a systemic issue due to prior reinforcement. So one of the things that we kind of talk about in behavior analysis is that as a company, you know, you might have an entire system and we view the one individual, but those behaviors, those actions that take place are typically from prior reinforcement from their environment. So how can we impact the environment we're a part of? Here's a little example. Let's say this guy on the right on his phone, he made an insensitive joke. These two men, in the middle, they, they brush it off, they're reading their documents instead. And clearly this woman in the orange skirt is not thrilled by what he said. He's off in the corner laughing to himself. If no one says anything about this, he might think everyone's okay with it. If you laugh because you're uncomfortable when he says the joke, he might think that you're genuinely laughing at that joke. So we need to be aware of how our own actions might be even involuntarily reinforcing the behaviors that we don't want to see. And part of behavior analysis is a balance of variables. So there's the good behavior, let's say, versus the bad behavior. As managers, supervisors, leaders, we don't just want a productive workplace, but a place where productivity doesn't sacrifice happiness, health, and the well-being of the workforce. So by using something like a balance of variables, 
you ultimately want the good behavior to win by having stronger antecedents, stronger consequences, stronger reinforcers. By having these, the behavior is going to be more likely to occur or to increase or to maintain. So we wanna make sure that we're reinforcing what we wanna see and equally as important, not reinforcing what we don't want to see. If you don't want this to be said in your place of work, if you don't want someone to act like this towards another person, if you don't want this sort of culture, make sure that we're not reinforcing that behavior. And this can impact the entire company. As I briefly talked about earlier, I expect all of you to be leaders here. And for any real change to take place, leaders, managers, supervisors have to model the behavioral norms that are expected. And a big part of this is support and accountability. You're not only supposed to talk the talk, you have to walk the walk and reinforce other behaviors of those who are walking the walk as well. You see someone who's acting in a way that you think is beneficial to the company, to culture, to the other people that they're working with, commemorate them. I love how you said this. I really enjoyed when you this. Oh, what a great idea. Something as simple as that could be reinforcing for an individual. So last but not least, one of the things I wanna talk about today is allyship. Ally is a label that you earn, not one that you give yourself. This is important because your perception of how you're doing as an ally might not align with how your colleagues view you. So on the top here, I have being an ally is a chosen role because it's an action that you need to do again and again that is elected. And an active role, it's continual. As I said at the start of this presentation, this is a lifelong process. And it is a role that is earned because those around you should identify you as an ally. It's very possible that you might not be an ally, even if you think that you are. So maybe ask your colleagues about it. Ask them what you could do to be a better ally. So let's talk about some basics and then some leveling up. What can we do? Basics, do your homework. Google first. Google first is a big suggestion I have. You're unsure about something, Google it. Google has tons of answers. View something that's probably a scholarly background, but even a brief Google search will give you an idea of where you are on this. One of the things that I've read a lot about in my time of education is that unfortunately, what typically happens a lot is that when we have questions as white individuals, we will approach someone who is black or of color, or if you have a question as a straight individual, you ask someone who is in the LGBT community, or if you have a question about someone as an able-bodied individual, you will ask someone who is non-able-bodied. It is not their responsibility to teach you. And this is something that is very important and something that when I first started learning, I was like, well, I feel like I should ask the people who know the best, but it's not their job. It's not their job to teach you, it's your job to teach you. So before you're gonna ask someone a question, Google it. That's big, big number one. Next, understand your privilege. We can do that by doing those implicit bias tests. We can do that by seeing where we come from. There's a lot of videos that you can see where they do activities where it's take one step forward if you grew up with a two parent household. Take one step forward if you're white. Take one step forward if you're cisgender. And doing those sorts of activities can help you realize all these forms of privilege that you didn't previously realize you had. On that note too, challenge your biases. You think that there might be a certain way why you think something, why? Think about your prior history. Think about your history reinforcement. Think about your experiences and then surround yourself with education, materials, and literature that will help you further to understand this group of individuals. Next, interact appropriately with others. This is something that, um, I shouldn't really have to say, but that's why it's in basics. So interact appropriately with others. We wanna make sure we're using inclusive language. If someone uses he, him pronouns, use he, him pronouns. If someone uses they, them pronouns, use they, them pronouns. If someone goes by Osivia, don't call them O. Be respectful to all, that's a big part of this too. When you're interacting with someone, by taking into account their culture, their values, their associations, you are being more respectful of that individual as an entire unit. And lastly, in the basics category, diversify that network. If you look at all the people that you sit with at lunch and they're all you, maybe have different people in your circle. If you're only talking to the same people over and over, you're not learning, you're not expanding your brain, you're not opening up all the possibilities of everything there is to know. 
diversify the individuals you're talking to. Level up, use your privilege. So it's important that we listen and support those in our environment, but we're not speaking over them. We want to speak up, but not for. As an ally, you shouldn't be silencing the voices of those that you are trying to provide support to. You should be backing them up. And then obviously model ideal behaviors. You wanna be, if you have a question, like for example, if someone comes into your place of work and you're unsure of if you should refer to them as she or he or they, that's a perfect time where you just ask that question. Hi, I just wanna make sure that I'm referring to you in the way that you would like. What are your pronouns? From my experience in working with LGBT individuals, every single trans or non-binary friend I've had, I've asked them this question of, would you prefer someone just say like they or guess and then possibly be wrong? Or would you prefer them to just ask? And they're like, oh my goodness, please just ask. Please just ask. I'm not gonna take it offensively. Just ask me, it's fine, it's who I am. On that note too, have those conversations. Conversations are difficult. Right now in the past couple of years, in the past year specifically, it's been a big time where people have been reducing their friend groups, we'll say. People are reducing the people that they're friends with on Facebook. They are removing LinkedIn membership requests. They are not talking to family members, perhaps. And that's something that for some individuals, that's what you need to do for your mental health and for your benefit. But if you're cutting off these people that you don't agree with in your life, who's having those conversations with them? If, for example, you have a guardian, a paternal or maternal figure who acts in a specific way that you don't think is appropriate or refers to people in terms that you don't think are appropriate and you cut them off from your life, who's having that conversation with them? Who is helping them learn? Who is providing them with the same resources that you were provided with so that you could do your own learning, your own education, your own research? Who's going to give that to them if you're not there? And it might not have to be you, but that's something to keep in mind. Uh, especially as us, as a lot of the people in this room are predominantly white. So that's why I keep saying us as white individuals. But a lot of the people in this room that I can see are white or white passing. So if you are removing this connection, who's having that hard conversation? Probably no one. And then how are we changing the culture we're a part of? How are we changing the environment if we're not having those hard conversations? Next, that balance of consequences. Reinforce the things you want to see. Don't reinforce the things you don't want to see. You don't like when he makes you feel uncomfortable at work. Don't laugh at his uncomfortable sexual based joke anymore. Say, hey, that makes me feel uncomfortable. Have those hard conversations. It might be something that's difficult and that's very possible. But by even not responding, it may punish their behavior. By not doing that awkward laugh, by not doing that awkward smile, that might be enough for them to be like, oh, no one laughed at my joke. That was rude. I guess these people don't find me funny. I won't say jokes anymore. And then last but not least, obviously, apologize when you error. I can say for sure this has happened to me multiple times. I referred to someone as she and their pronouns are they. Afterwards, I said, hey, I just wanted to say I'm so sorry I referred to you as she earlier. I will refer to you as they from now on. No worries. Apologies mean a lot, especially when you're on the receiving end. Um, and obviously only apologize if you're genuine, no one wants a non-genuine apology. So it's crucial that white individuals continue their work on anti-racism and beyond. And this isn't just white individuals and anti-racism. This is straight individuals and LGBT discrimination. This is cisgender individuals and transgender discrimination. This is able-bodied individuals and non-able-bodied discrimination. It's important to remain grounded in the current issues that these individuals face. And we as individuals need to commit ourselves to understanding how intersectionality plays a role in our prejudice and our bias and our discriminatory actions. So one of the big things that I want us to do today is you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna go back to that sheet of paper that you wrote down your privileges and your biases on. And what we're going to do is we are going to do a one minute write up 
in which we verbalize a goal that is measurable and time bound. What is one way you intend to commit to being a better ally? So I want you to go ahead and write this down and I want it to be something that's measurable. So it could be um, a quantity, it could be a frequency, it could be a rate, it could be a duration or an amount of time, and then something that's time bound. So you wanna do it by a specific date. Do you wanna do it by March 1st? Do you wanna do it within this year? Do you wanna do it within this week? So I'm gonna give you until about 2.39 to go ahead and write that down. Once again, these aren't gonna be shared unless you really wanna share it, I'd love to hear it, but just be honest to yourself. That's what's most important right now. So I encourage you to please actually do the goal that you just wrote up. Maybe find someone else that you know in this Zoom room and ask them to be your accountability buddy. Ask them to check in with you on that time frame that you were discussing. If you don't know anyone in this Zoom room, maybe I'll ask Jillian to send me all of your emails and I'll send you an email in a week or so from now and say, hey, how is your goal going? What's going on? Let's check in. Let's give some feedback. Let's see what we can do next, because this is something that you're going to continually change, continually adapt, and continually grow in. As I previously said, being an ally is something that's earned, it's active, and it's something that you need to continue to do throughout the course of your lifetime. If you want to have a real impact within your field, your institution, or beyond, then the realization that some people do not like you may actually be a sign of what you are doing right. Having those hard conversations, respecting individuals, even if they're different than yourself, it might lead to some people not liking you. Being in the realm of giving talks on diversity, uh, my other research pertains to gun violence. I have a lot of individuals that don't like me. That's the price sometimes. There are going to be people that disagree with you, but when you're making an impact, when you're doing something that's right, when you're doing something for the benefit of people, sometimes people aren't going to like you. And that's important to keep in mind. That's important to know. And that's important to remind yourself sometimes. I want to re-provide you with information on the implicit bias test in case you wanted to go take one of these on your own. There are an entire variety. One of the previous implicit bias tests that I took because I was like, oh, I'm curious about this. I never thought about this before was if I had a bias for slender individuals compared to overweight individuals. And it turned out I had a moderate bias towards individuals who were overweight compared to individuals that were skinnier. That's something I never knew about myself, something that I never would have thought I would have, but it's important for me to know in the future when I'm interacting with individuals, am I treating them differently based off of what my own bias is and why do I have that bias? So I wanted to put up this link for you on the screen. I'll also send it to Jillian in case she sends out an email at the end um, so that you guys can easily click it instead of trying to write it down, but just poke around. There's a ton of different options in this. There's race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, um, cis versus transgender, gun usage, presidents, et cetera, et cetera. So go ahead, poke around, see, take a couple of tests that you think you might have biases in, and then maybe take a test that you don't think you have a bias in and see what the result is. And then were you shocked by it? So after you go and take this test on your own, did you get the same result that you thought you were going to get? Was it different? Why do you think it was different? 
and evaluate your own history, evaluate your own background, your own prejudice, your own bias, because by doing sorts of things like this, it allows us to figure out what we need to consciously, consciously work on and train on and go to continual talks on. So I think I'm around three minutes early right now, but I wanted to thank you guys all so much for coming to my talk. I should have re-put my email on this ending slide, but I didn't. Um, so I'll go back to the beginning and then real quick, just a reference slide in case you're interested on any of the information I referenced or on any of the videos that I included. And thank you all so much for coming today and participating. I was clicking around when I had you guys do the active activities and I saw a lot of you were looking down writing. So I really appreciate you taking part in these activities because having this sort of self-reflection is going to be beneficial for you, especially when it's time for you to go ahead and redo that training on your own, redo those courses on your own and see where you want to start. Having those notes of where you currently are is going to be beneficial for you. So thank you all so much for coming today. And if you have any questions, we have around 18 minutes now for me to hear them. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable asking them now, you can feel free to email them to me later. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah, anyone with a question, feel free to type it in the chat box or um, you can unmute yourself and, and ask her in person. Um, we definitely wanted to leave time at the end for questions and discussion. So we encourage, encourage that. Jackie, this is Paul Sakala. I had asked a question in the chat earlier. Um, in my role as a career coach, I'm coming across a lot of people facing ageism as a uh, prejudice. Um, how would you include that in this conversation? I'm sorry, I didn't see your question in the chat. I'm scrolling up to it right now. Because I see everyone now is like, there was a question. In okay, here. Mm. So ageism is certainly something that is present as a prejudicial force in the workplace. This is something that is not only seen from the youth to the old, or old, that's a poor term, um, from the novice individuals to the veteran individuals and vice versa. And it's important to note too that a veteran could be someone who's younger or who's older. Um, it's one of the things I often have read about or suggest is that idea of mentorship that we previously talked about. Mentors can go in either direction. Someone who is on the older half of the older half versus the younger half, both have different pieces of information and knowledges that they can help each other with. So someone who has been in the field of sales for longer probably has a better idea of how to interact with these individuals, how to do these phone calls, how to do an in-person consultation. Whereas someone who's younger might have better experience on the social media aspect. So one of the big things that I've read in the research and that I previously suggested is when you're doing those mentors, have a younger mentor with an older mentor, because you can learn different things from each other, which is going to then found, it's going to be a foundation of a form of respect because you have this one individual that you're learning from that's learning from you. So it's creating that rapport building relationship to reduce the ageism because you're seeing the benefit of the other individual's age group. Did that help your question at all, Paul? It, it does, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for asking a question. Any other questions for Jackie? We have about 15 minutes. So I just wanna make sure everyone gets an opportunity uh, before we end the meeting. I have a couple questions. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Are you guys okay hearing me? Yes, I can hear you great. Okay, great, thanks. First, first question. Can we get a copy of your material? This was good. Yes, I can send them to Jillian, or I guess I shouldn't answer on behalf of Jillian, but I'm pretty sure she said earlier that she'd send an email. Great. Okay. I can send my presentation to Jillian, um, and she will send it out in her email that she sends. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Uh, second question or issue, topic. Um, yes. I'm unsure of what biases, you know, or prejudices, or um, what was the other... Um, term. I, I don't know what they are. Um, when I'm in my daily routine, um, I go through what I do. Um, so it has to be observed first, I would imagine. And then, you know, because a lot of this is, as you're talking, is is cultural. It's changing language. 
It's changing how we practice and behave towards each, each other. Okay, so how do I know that? When I go back to work tomorrow, how do I know that I have an implicit bias or um, some kind of um, way forward? What's I, Go ahead. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Okay. So one of the first ways to kind of figure out some of those biases you might have, go ahead and take one of those tests. Okay. But another option, right, outside of that, find someone that you trust at work, that you feel comfortable with at work, who frequently observes you. Um, this could be someone who is similar to you, but I think it would be more beneficial if it was someone who's different than you. So if you were a male, perhaps asking a woman, or if you are white, perhaps asking someone, just whoever you feel comfortable with that you think is going to provide you with genuine feedback. They're not just going to say whatever they think you want them to say to appease you. They're going to actually tell you how you are in your workplace, in your actions, in your behaviors with others. Ask someone in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, hey, I want to make sure that I'm being someone who is a good ally for those around me and a beneficial add-on to the culture in our workplace. Is there anything I'm doing at work that you think I could be doing better? Or what are some things that I do that you think are great? What are things that you think I do that are beneficial so that I can know to keep doing those things, but also some other things that I can work on? And if you can find someone in your association that's very comfortable having this conversation with you, they're going to obviously want you to do those changes because they're going to want you to succeed, right? A big part of this is you're going to be a better person at work. You know, people are going to enjoy talking to you, enjoy hanging out with you, hearing everything that you have to say, seeing what you have to say with others. You're going to be someone that anyone who cares about you is going to want you to be successful, right? I feel like we all know this. So if it's someone that feels comfortable talking with you, they want you to be successful, they're going to be honest with you on things that you can change or things that you're doing well. Feedback is always huge. <laughs> Feedback. Um, and the second part was the privilege. Are these, do they, do they come from each other? If I have an, you know, an implicit bias, does it come from privilege? You know, are they connected um, somewhat? So technically, I don't know the answer to that because technically I think it's a correlation. I don't think one comes from the other, um, but they do, I would imagine uh, on average, they're going to present hand in hand. Um, so it's probably far more likely for someone who has the privilege of being cisgender to have a bias towards someone who is transgender while they're not necessarily one is going to be with the other, um, it's going to be much less likely that someone who is transgender is going to have a negative bias towards others who are transgender. While it is completely possible, I would say typically they would present hand in hand. Thank you. Yeah, of Thanks. course. Thank you for asking questions. Jackie, there are a couple more questions in the chat. chat. Okay. <laughs> From Gail and Allison. Okay, I'm reading Gail's right now. Gail, that is a complicated question. Sorry, that's my timer to make sure I didn't go over time in my presentation. <laughs> Gail, that is a difficult question. I grew up here and I just had to make my eyes blind for people who do not. Who do not trust people they think are white even though i'm not so they think that you're white even though you're not white and you feel like yes they don't trust you because of this yes I recommend this one of the big things i might recommend talking about is with your the individuals that you're surrounded with or perhaps the individuals that you're working with maybe bringing up conversations about culture asking them more about their culture or sharing your asian heritage perhaps would be something that is something that would allow them to have more insight on your values as an individual your experience your history as an individual and then they would have a better idea of who you are as a person and that you are someone that they can connect with someone that they can bond with someone who took the time to share information about themselves with someone who might not necessarily trust you, if you're opening up yourself, you're being vulnerable, 
that might be something that's beneficial. That's a hard question though. And that's not something I've previously faced. Well, I can tell you that um, in the work situation, um, one of my coworkers, she had two young twins and she brought them to work. I met them and they cowered in fear when they met me. And I had to ask her afterwards. I said, why, why were your kids like that? I, you know, did I scare them? What was going on? She said, oh, they, they're scared of white people. They don't trust white people. I said, but I'm not white. <laughs> and so it took some time, but I eventually made friends with them and um, they realized that I wasn't a monster. So One of the main things I would suggest, um, and this is something just from my own prior knowledge in organizational behavior management is the idea of trust is essentially having strong say do correspondence. So if you say you're gonna do something, following up and actually doing it is what's going to be the thing that builds trust, that lets individuals believe that they can trust you. So that might be a strong first step too. If you know how you said like building the relationship with the kids, you could do the same thing with those that you're surrounded with, those that you work with, build up that trust component. If you say you're gonna do something, do that thing. Even if it's something that seems like it's not a big deal, provide prior examples of times that you've followed through with what you're going to do or who you are as a person or the kind of actions that you modeling the behaviors that you want to see right modeling the kind of person you are having multiple exemplars for them to look back on and be like oh i can't i shouldn't be afraid of gail she this 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 gail's great even if she is white even though i know you said you're not white but like in their minds even if she is white gail's great you know, so by building up the example of trust, those ideas of trust that they can have a vulnerable, open and trusting relationship with you is one of the first steps, I would say, but it's definitely a difficult field to navigate. Well, when um, I'd like to end with that woman that i spoke of, um, we ended up becoming the best of friends. She retired, we're still friends. We go birding together. Oh, uh, good grown now and they love me so it's okay <laughs> but I, I just want to throw that out as an example yeah no I love that thank you so much Gail I'm glad to hear that you guys are friends now <laughs> thank you Allison I see your question next regarding ageism how can someone who is experiencing it be proactive specifically in hiring selection um are you still in the room with us Yes, I'm here. Oh, you are. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Are you referring to which realm of ageism? Um, specifically, uh, like they don't think we're agile enough to form, you know, the new processes or maybe even have social media experience or um, digital experience or like that. Um, so one of the main suggestions I would have there is I imagine that you do have that experience, which is why you're bringing it up. They assume that you don't have it. Ensuring mm -hmm. that you have some sort of permanent product of your ability to do those things, whether it be a line on your resume or perhaps providing actual materials that you've previously created, whether it be a PowerPoint, an Excel, a graph, a um, marketing presentation to provide when you are applying to that place of work, if it is relatable, obviously, to that place of employment, to show that you have some of these permanent products of the skill set that they're looking for. It's not ideal, but unfortunately, um, I can't <laughs> go into every organization and tell them to get it together. But by having some sort of pro permanent product showing your skill set, I think that would be something that would be beneficial specifically in hiring or selection process. And also, Jackie, um, you know, they see uh, years of experience on your your resume and automatically assume that you're just too old to do it. You know, you have 23 years of X, Y, Z experience, and they're probably looking for someone who's 23 years old. You know, how do you how do you overcome that? I think one of the other options to overcome that too is to show that you are someone who's going to continue to adapt. You are someone who is going to adapt, whether it be 
with culture, whether it be with work, whether it be with technology, and having some sort of statement about that or having that as one of your answers for a question, perhaps, talking about your ability to adapt to novel situations. And regardless of your age, that's something that everyone would have benefit from. So even something like showing that you have a full-fledged LinkedIn account that has all of your information on it. It shows that you're technologically savvy and right. that you can adapt in as time goes on to be able to change to whatever the need might be for that company. Thank you so much. Of course. I hope I answered your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, you did. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay. Julia. Paul, were you going to say something? No. Okay. I just saw your mic go on, so I figured I'd ask right. Paul. No, you're fine. Um, I have a Fred, I see you have a question about bias as a needed skill to navigate daily life. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so I, I've thought about this particular aspect of it for a while, and I, I never get a, a, a quite um, satisfactory way in my own mind for integrating this. But it seems to me that biases, prejudices, or prejudging, and there's a lot of prejudging that's necessary just to navigate daily life. Now, they, they don't always help us, but they're necessary. I mean, you're, you're doing a first scan of your environment at all times to assess a potential danger. And you may determine, you, you may have a bias that, that, that is um, not uh, assisting you in it properly. But there may be many of those that are your first scan and do keep you out of situations, for example, that are danger, I mean, dangerous. I mean, that's, that's an example of, of, I think, a kind of bias and maybe almost the reasons that we have biases. We can't start fresh with every object and every person we see and not make some kind of judgment about our inherent safety. And, I have, yeah. and that's something that too is mentioned in a different part of that video that I showed a brief little snippet of. One of the things that they talk about is that previously when we think of our ancestors in order to adapt as time would go on in order for them to be the individuals that survived and made it on when you saw someone who didn't look like you that person was a threat regardless of who they were and that's something that's in our old brain and our limbic structures where you're responding to these things for your survival benefit for your adaption for your evolution one of the main things now though is you're not one of the ancestors, right? We know that. So while you might have the internal monologue, the difference between your prejudice and your bias versus discrimination are your thoughts or your private behavior versus the actions that you do, the behaviors that others can see, the way that you treat other individuals. So while yes, there definitely are some underlying biases that we all have and that's from adaption and from evolution that's why it's the implicit bias test right you're not you didn't know that you had this i know that i was pro like towards larger people versus smaller people who knew but it all lies in the way that we treat others so yes bias is absolutely something that's going to be a part of one's life but acknowledging that you might have that bias that you might have that prejudice and utilizing that when it comes to how you treat someone else and keeping that in mind that I might, Hey, maybe I'll treat this person differently because I think this way. So I'll make a point to blah, 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 blah. So actively counteracting a negative bias you might have. So that's not a discriminatory action. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. And um, I think Fred, actually, you'd really like the Ted talk that, I included like the one minute and 30 seconds from she talks all about exactly what you just mentioned. So I would definitely go give it a watch. Thank you. I will, I will do that. Awesome. So it just in the interest of everyone's schedule and, and staying on time, we, we've reached the, the one o'clock hour mark. Um, but I want to thank you all so much for joining us on your lunch hour to learn something new and something that's important. Um, thank you, Jackie, so much for taking the time to share this with us. Um, just the research, the education, encouraging us to turn inward, have honest conversations with ourselves, and then also giving us action items and resources. And I'm just so appreciative. Um, and you're just awesome. And I love you. Um, so for everyone, <laughs> I'm going to, as soon as I have the link to the Zoom recording, I'm going to send everyone who registered an email um, 
with Jackie's email, like she said, you're welcome to reach out to her if you have additional questions that we didn't have time for. Um, a copy of her slides, a link to the Zoom recording, a link to the TED Talk that she shared, um, and a link to the Harvard test. So if um, there's anything that you want to follow up on, I'll make sure that all those resources are there for you. And um, finally, I just want to thank you all for attending, for sharing your personal stories, and for asking such great questions, both in person and in the chat. And um, I hope we see you for another event soon. Feel free to reach out to me if you have questions as well. And I wish you all a wonderful day. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks for joining. Yay. Have a great day.